I invite you to open a Bible to Luke chapter 11 as we continue going through parables of Jesus and learning what it means for us spiritually and as disciples of Christ. And as you're opening a Bible to Luke chapter 11, we begin by going to God in prayer to enlighten our hearts and minds with his word. Our first prayer is for ourselves that the Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts and minds this morning the clear gospel of Jesus and that our faith would be encouraged. Our second prayer is for our brothers and sisters in Christ, the Holy Spirit would open their minds and hearts to receive the word of God and that they would grow closer to Christ this morning. And finally, I ask that you would pray for me that I would speak faithfully and truthfully the word of God and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ for all to hear. Psalm 19 says, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So Luke chapter 11 has one of the lesser famous parables of Jesus, the friend that comes at midnight. Now there's a very famous line in it, the ask, seek, knock line that many of you probably have heard and memorized before, but the rest of the story is not as famous as when we looked at the parable of the sower, the parable of the good Samaritan, right, or many of the other parables that Jesus has told. Yet this one is just as important. And so what I want to do this morning as we go through this is teach you uh, three things about prayer. So if you are a note taker, I'm gonna tell you what they are right now that Jesus teaches us about prayer uh, through this parable because if you have a Bible open, you'll notice that right before verse five, there's verses one through four, and those are the Lord's Prayer. So at the beginning of this chapter, the disciples come to Jesus and ask him, teach us to pray. And so he's telling this parable to teach his disciples, to teach you and me, how should we pray? What, What do we do when we pray? How do we approach God in prayer? So here are the three things, and there's a bonus one at the end, just for fun. The first is pray shamelessly. All right, we'll get into these. Pray shamelessly. Number two is pray relentlessly. So pray relentlessly. And then number three, pray despite yourself. So number three is pray despite yourself. So at the beginning of chapter 11, they go to Jesus and say, teach us to pray. We get Luke's version of the Lord's Prayer. And then after the Lord's Prayer, Jesus keeps teaching them how to pray with this parable. In verse five, he said to them, Which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. Now, this is kind of an interesting story, because in their culture, hospitality was one of the most important principles to live by. And when it says midnight, for them, midnight really meant Midnight, everything is dark, everything is shut down, you're not hanging out because there's no electricity, there's no lights, there's no iPhones. Like any of you night owls that are like, midnight, I'm still awake, right? That's me, right? I have terrible sleep habits, I know this. But for them, midnight is we've all been asleep for a very long time, right? So just imagine you're peacefully asleep, everything's calm, the world is shut down, and your friend comes charging up to your door, smashing on the door, knocking on it really hard, going, I need some bread. How many of you are gonna be like, sure, let me get you some bread? Or you're gonna be a little annoyed with your friend for disturbing your whole household, right? Because this is what the man said. He's gonna answer him from within in verse seven, do not bother me, (laughs) which is just, it's a great friend to have, right? It's late at night, don't bother me. I will help you in the morning, right? Do not bother me. The door is now shut, which means what? I didn't open the door for you. I'm, I'm talking to you through the ring camera, okay? Like, it's midnight. I'm not getting out of bed. I'm not getting dressed. So the door's not open. This is a terrible friend, kind of, but you're also a terrible friend for showing up at his house for a loaf of bread at midnight, because you're like, I've got nothing for my other friend, all right? So the door is now shut. My children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. Now, this is 
kind of an interesting parable, right? Because what does it sound like? It says, there was a person who is in need that goes to a friend for help at midnight. Remember, Jesus is doing what? He's teaching us what? How to pray. And the friend who gets the prayer request, who, who's asked for the bread, says what? I'm not going to give you anything. I'm not going to help you. Now, if the parable just ended there, you'd be like, well, prayer sounds like a bummer. Because how many of you have been up at midnight with a prayer before? Or a little bit later than that? And you're hoping that when you knock on the door, God's going to what? Give you the bread, give you what you need, and not say, I can't give you anything. Now, one of the things that Jesus does in this parable and some of his other parables is he uses negative examples of human selfishness, human greed, our own sinfulness, to say God is the opposite of that. So he's saying, look, there's this friend. You go to him at midnight, this great time of need. It's an emergency. You're up late at night losing sleep over it, and you ask him for help, and he says, I can't give you anything. But what we're going to see as the parable goes on, that's not how God works. But I do think it's often how Satan wants you to think he works. I can't bother God right now. It's too late. It's too annoying. It's too whatever. I'll just, I'll just get through it on my own. I'll just take care of it on my own. I don't need to bother him. Or sometimes Satan wants you to think, he'll just tell me I don't have anything for you. The door is shut, right? But that's not what Jesus tells us. So verse 8, Jesus says, I tell you, Though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend. That's a great reason. Anybody ever do something like you're supposed to do it out of love, but if you were being honest in the moment, you didn't do it out of love, but you just did it because what? You had to, or you felt elbowed. Just show of hands. Let's all just confess before God how selfish we are. Anybody ever done that? Yeah, okay. It's okay. We're all in this together. All right. When I was a little kid, I learned this lesson where my mom's best friend was moving, and the night before, my mom's tucked me in, and she goes, are you excited to help our friend move tomorrow? And I looked my mom right in the eyes, and I said, no, which creates a whole variety of other issues. But <laughs> and she goes, well, that's a real terrible attitude. You need to learn something about love. Okay, and I was 10, and I've had time to grow and mature since then. But sometimes we do that, right? Jesus say, look, he's not getting up and helping him because he's his friend. He's not getting up and helping him because of love. He's getting up and helping him because of his, and the translation here says impudence. He will rise and give him whatever he needs. So he's saying, not, out, not because we're friends, but because of this man's, the guy making the request, his impudence, some translations say persistence, but the Greek word is anandia, and it means shamelessness. Because you gotta think about it, it's midnight. What is everybody else doing? And they got their houses shut and locked and secured. Everybody's asleep. To get up and get bread, either they are, either had to have some or it's like, I'd have to get up and make it for you and disturb the whole household. This is so inconvenient. Yet Jesus says the reason he's going to give him the bread is because the man making the request was shameless. Um, other ways to translate it is immodest, so, or having no self-respect. <laughs> so just like, I'm here, right? So how many of you, out of pride, or self-respect, if you want to be nicer to yourself this morning, have not asked for help before, when you knew you needed it? You don't have to, you're like, I'm not raising my hand, I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> Because out of pride, I won't tell anybody that I've been there. But we've done this, right? We would say, I have too much self-respect. I have too much dignity, pride to ask for that kind of help. And yet, Jesus says, this man's going to get the bread. He's going to get what he needs. Because in his request, he was shameless. He had no self-respect. He said, this is what I need in my life right now, God. And so I'm not too proud to go to God in prayer and say, this is the request. 
This is what I need in my life. This is what this person that I love needs in their life. This is the change that I need to see happen. Whatever your request is. And so this is the first thing Jesus is teaching us in this uh, parable about prayer is to pray shamelessly, which sounds probably weird and strange the way many of us were taught to pray, which is to show a lot of reverence and respect and, and properness, right? There's nothing proper about him running over at midnight to his friend's house and slamming on the door going, I need bread. That's not, there's nothing proper about that. The proper thing would be to what? Wait until the morning when everybody gets going and go, hey, I have a friend that's visiting and I don't have any food for him. Can you help me with it? And yet, Jesus says, remember, the question that the disciples asked was, teach us to pray. How should we pray? So Jesus is saying, I want you to pray shamelessly to the Father in heaven. Don't put it off. Don't wait. Don't have too much pride to say, I've got too much self-respect. I shouldn't need help in this area. I shouldn't need this or whatever it might be. I think I can fix it myself. And Jesus is saying, no, I want you to pray shamelessly. I want you to pray without any self-respect and just go to God empty-handed going, even if it's at midnight, Lord, this is what I need. And then he tells us in verse nine, he keeps going with his story. And I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. This is the part you know. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For the, everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Now the interesting things about this is in English it sounds like just do it once, right? Ask means what? Just, just ask once, seek and then knock, right? So it sounds like just do it one time, and it'll work out. How many of you have prayed once and didn't get the answer you were looking for on that first try? Anybody? Now, here's the thing. In the Greek, these are uh, present tense imperatives, which means you got to keep doing them, okay? It just doesn't translate well into English, right? And so it means literally would be keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. So the second thing that Jesus is teaching us in prayer is pray relentlessly. Pray without giving up. Right? To, to keep going to him, to keep asking, to keep seeking, to keep knocking until what? Your friend opens the door and goes, here's some bread, even though it's midnight. Right? The interesting thing about the word seek, it's zeteo, and it means to keep uh, looking for or striving for. To, the, to investigate and strive after until you what? Find what you're looking for. And, and, until the door opens and the bread is given to you. And so Jesus is saying, I want you to pray like this. I want you to pray relentlessly. So the, qu the question I had to wrestle with myself um, because Martin Luther's uh, mentor told him, we preach best what we gotta learn the most which is super convicting for everybody that ever preaches and teaches. Um, he told that to Luther right before he went off to teach for the first time, and Luther said, I don't know it well enough. And he's like, you'll learn as you go, all right? And the question I had to ask myself as I was preparing this sermon was, are there things in my own heart, in my own life, where I've given up on prayer before, all right? Because sometimes it's exhausting to keep on knocking. Like, I asked, well, I asked again, Right, and then you try to take things into your own hands, and then you got that sort of helpful friend that comes along and goes, well, have you prayed about it? And you snap back real quick. Obviously, yes, of course, yeah, I've already prayed for it, and what are we saying? It didn't work, so what has to happen now? I've gotta knock the door down, because <laughs> he's not opening it. And yet Jesus is telling us, here's how I want my disciples to pray, relentlessly, to keep on asking, to keep on seeking, to keep on knocking, which is why he tells another parable later on about not losing heart and not giving up in prayer. Okay, so the story keeps going, and Jesus is gonna, again, use a negative example of how evil and sinful we are as people to show us how God is so much better. So verse 11, he asks the question, what father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit 
to those who ask him. So number three is to pray despite yourself. So Jesus is talking to the 12 apostles, his most intimate and trusted disciples. And he's saying, here's how I want you to pray. I want you to pray shamelessly. I want you to pray relentlessly. And I want you to pray despite yourself because oftentimes we don't pray because we don't think we are good enough. We don't think we deserve it. All right, how many of you are poor, miserable sinners? At least throughout the week, sometimes. <laughs> we think, well, because I've sinned, because I've messed up, I can't what? Go to God. And yet, Jesus looks in verse 13. He's, remember who he's talking to. Peter, James, John, Andrew, all these guys, right? The best of the disciples he's got. He's looking at them, the people that love him and are following him no matter what. He goes, if you who are evil. So what did he just call his disciples? Evil, which is, they're probably like, wait a minute, what? <laughs> he goes, if you're evil, and that you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So he's saying, you're evil, but I still want you to do what? Pray. I still want you to come to the Father and ask for the Holy Spirit. I still want you to come to the Father and ask for the bread that you need in your life. And so we pray despite ourselves, even if you're like, I had a really bad week. I had a bad month. I haven't felt close to God in forever. I don't think God is for me. I don't know if God loves me. I don't know if I love God because I'm struggling with all this sin and whatever else is in my life. And Jesus goes, oh no, prayer is still for you. He says, if you who are evil, you could still pray to the Father. So we pray despite ourselves, not because of how awesome we are, but despite the fact that we don't always measure up. We're not always awesome. We're not always amazing and great and perfect. And yet he's saying, but your Father will still love you and hear your prayers and give you the Holy Spirit and give you what you need. So we pray shamelessly, we pray relentlessly, we pray despite ourselves, and here's the bonus one that without this one, you, you're never gonna get prayer right. Because this is the most important one. He says, pray like a child, okay? I want you to pray like a child and not an employee. And here's what I mean by this. So often we act like I'm an employee of God, he's the boss, he's in charge. I mean, he is in charge, but we treat it like, okay, and if I behave a certain way, if I do good enough, I earn currency with God, and therefore he will what? He will answer my prayers. Not just that he will answer my prayers. We even sometimes have the attitude of he will have to answer my prayers because he, he owes me. Because look how good I was. Look how well behaved I was. Look at all the good things that I did, God. So I did my part, right? So now, God, I need you to do your part. But when we have that mentality and that view of God of just this judge or this employer that we owe a debt to, we, we've got to appease and kind of work for all the time, it will ruin your prayer life. It will ruin your relationship with him. Because you will always be wondering, are my prayers going to work? Is he going to hear my prayers? Have I been good enough for him to say yes to them? Have I been so bad that he's not even listening to me? Yet throughout this parable and out throughout this chapter, when they go, Lord, teach us to pray, the first part of the Lord's prayer is what? Father, meaning what? Jesus is saying, when you approach God in prayer, you are approaching him not as an employee who owes a debt, but as his what? His child. And then later on, when he's telling the, if you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give to you? And see, if you understand and, and believe and know that God is your heavenly Father, not your judge or not your employer, but he's your Father, and you understand that you belong to him because you are his child, then you will know with confidence, I can pray shamelessly. Because how many of you have a boss that would really appreciate you calling them at midnight with a really tiny question request? Like, yeah, I'm totally getting a promotion now. Right? Or what if you just showed up at their door, you didn't call them, you just started knocking on their door, and you're like, hey, no, I was thinking about that email last week. How many of you have a boss or have had a boss that you think would really appreciate that? 
but a father would, right? Because if a child goes, I have a need, I'm scared, I'm upset, I don't, I, there's something bothering me. A father would love for their child to come to them at midnight with any need and go, how can I help you? How can I love you? How can I make you feel safe? Right? That's what a good father would do. So if I understand that God is my father who loves me perfectly because of Jesus, and through Jesus he has adopted you and made you his own daughter or son, then you, like Paul says in Galatians, can cry out, Abba, Father, at any time of night. You can pray shamelessly. You can say, I got no self-respect. I need my father to take care of me and to provide for me and to meet my needs. And if you understand he's your father, you can pray relentlessly because it's not going to annoy him. Because I think sometimes the devil wants us to view God as anything but a father. Because if I forget that he's my father, then I'll start to treat my prayer life as, I don't want to bother God with that. You don't realize how many times as a pastor I've heard that. Where people are like, oh, I don't want to bother God. My prayer's too small. I'll just take care of it myself. Right? And Jesus is like, oh, what? What are you talking about? No, I want you to pray relentlessly. If you've got something on your heart, ask him for it. Seek, knock, right? And he said, I will provide for you. I will give it to you. And so if I understand that God is my father, I will pray relentlessly because I'm not gonna annoy him. I'm not gonna drive him away, right? I'm not gonna give up because I know he loves me and he cares for me and he answers my prayers. And if I know that God is my father, who has perfectly loved me and redeemed me through Jesus and adopted me because of Christ. I can pray despite myself. Right? Sometimes people are like, it's been a long time since I prayed because I felt really far from God. It's been a long time since I've uh, talked to God because I did all these things in my life. I lived a certain way. And yet God is saying, no, because you're his child and he is your father, even though you're evil, poor, miserable sinner throughout the week, Guess what Jesus tells you to do? Pray anyway. Pray to your heavenly Father. But if I view God as this judge or my boss who I've got to appease and make up things for and do this and that for him to hear me, he'll never pray. Other than every once in a while, you'll be like, oh, I'll give it a shot. But when you realize Jesus has made you a child of God, you'll understand, oh, God is now my heavenly father. And I can pray to him with anything, about anything, as often as I need. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that you, through your death and resurrection, have brought us into the family of faith and made us adopted children of our heavenly father. Holy Spirit, remind us of that truth in each and every day so that in our hearts and our minds we would know that we are children of God and that we can come to him with any prayer request, any day and any time, knowing that he hears our prayers and he answers them because he is a good and loving father. In your name we pray, amen.